when you're in a band, record sales are everything. And when you're in architecture, people paying you is everything. Welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And today I'm over here in Bergen County, New Jersey, just a stone's throw from the hustle and bustle of Midtown Manhattan with Plan Architecture, where I am speaking with the founder and principal, Dan D'Agostino. Plan architecture are all about whipping up designs that really make your lifestyle sing. They are purveyors of luxury and luxury experience. Um, They are very passionate and skilled team, and they've really carved out a niche for themselves, designing bespoke homes for um, high net worth individuals um, and including celebs theatre royalty and big names in the arts. Back in 2014, Dan, um, a person with a vision and a lot of architectural wizardry, set up Plan Architecture. Now they're the talk of the town as the biggest boutique firm around in these parts with a crew of 25 making magic under Dan's watchful eye. Dan always says Let's turn luxury architecture into something of an art form, one that not only looks smashing, but also ticks all the boxes for what you need and want. And let's do it with a bit of flair, creativity, and utmost professionalism. But Dan and the gang don't just stop at drawing up the plans. They're all about offering the full Monty from checking if your grand idea can actually take off to the nitty gritty of planning, designing interiors, sprucing up old spots, and even holding your hand through the building process. It is a full service um, luxury experience from start to finish that really sets them apart. Um, In 2018, they even kicked off their own in-house interior design team plan interiors uh, exclusive to their clients only and they really are um, phenomenal at being able to create intelligent thoughtful furniture selections um, and which is all designed to complement the architectural team uh, perfectly they've won most innovative full service architecture firm in new jersey for 2023 they also bagged a shiny aia gold medal a national kitchen and bath design award a lux red award and loads of kudos on house uh, and this interview was particularly brilliant from my perspective. Number one, I got to travel somewhere very interesting. Um, Dan spent a bit of time with me, you know, actually just showing me around where he practices in New Jersey. So I got an understanding of the economy, of the types of clients, the setting. Um, We spent some time actually in his studio uh, where he actually showed me how the practice was organized. And it was very interesting because you actually see the kind of production line that he set up there in order to have the business run very efficiently. And most importantly, Dan and I um, did the interview on a Saturday because in Dan's basement, Dan has a guitar kingdom. And um, both myself and Dan are avid guitar lovers. And it seemed appropriate that uh, we would have a little bit of jam. Don't worry, we've spared you um, any of our musical endeavors on this particular podcast. Though we had a lot of fun and we made some good sounds. Um, um, but it was it was really lovely actually going and seeing him in his house um, that they designed themselves. Um, Dan's got an amazing guitar collection. You'll see it in the video there. And we talk a little bit about, in the interview, the influence of being a musician and the music business on marketing um, and how that's kind of influenced a lot of Dan's career. We talk about creating luxury experience, working with consultants, milestone billing, um, and some of the constraints and some of the benefits of that. We talk about how to create a very efficient workflow in your organization. And we look at the importance of financial control in an architecture practice. So brilliant experience, thoroughly enjoyed um, talking and meeting with Dan and uh, I look forward to going and seeing him again very shortly to play more guitar. So sit back, relax and enjoy. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Dan, 
I feel like I just met you. I know. Isn't it great? <laughs> it's great. Welcome to the business of architecture. How are you? Very good. What an amazing day we've had already. I've had the grand tour of here in New Jersey. What's, the, what's this actual area so, called? Bergen County. Bergen County. Okay. And that, that was very useful because I've got a bit of a context of where you are actually practicing architecture. We're here in the basement of your beautiful home in basically my childhood dream. Mine too. <laughs> it doesn't, it did, I didn't buy it like this <laughs> or build it like this. There's an absolutely amazing collection of guitars, which we'll probably have to do another podcast just about the guitar collection and stay tuned to, to hear us jamming away. On I would song. love that. And we'll, we'll make a reference later on about your kind of past musical career, why it's relevant to, you know, kind of how you've been practicing architecture, how you've been developing, you know, your own business, of which Plan Architecture, you're the principal, you're the founder. How long have you guys been going? So 10 years, almost to the day. Wow. Since I quit my job. Amazing. And said, full-time plan architecture is for me. Amazing. Yeah. And you guys have got an incredible portfolio of kind of high-end residences here in the in the area. You're working with a lot of high net worth individuals. Mm -hmm. um, you're doing, you know, beautiful portfolio of work in a kind of classical tradition. There's modernist buildings in there as well. There's a real kind of strong sense of architectural design. The way the business is set up is really innovative. You've got interiors department. The, you've kind of streamlined each kind of compartment of the architectural process into its own team it's very very impressive. you don't need me at all i mean this is like <laughs> this is the forward to the book if we're doing a pamphlet i don't can we bottle that please you and it's, your accent to me i'm sure it's no accent to you just makes me sound so much better than i am so but let's was, clip that up it, it, it was it was very impressive and and i must i must say you know i was quite um inspired by actually going around the office this morning to actually see how it was organized because it gave a real sense of the business thought that has been going in it to make sure that you're you know you're producing profitable work i mean i was it was great that your uh, your financial controller was there on a saturday morning he's as always well. there <laughs> <laughs> making sure you know it had to be reflective of the process because i could describe architecture and interior design twice a day three times a day like groundhog day but like anybody a potential client a client a former client walking them through the space literally bringing them in to my living room mm -hmm. right and then i'm bringing them through the thought process how you process from interior design to the working drawings to the uh conceptual design to my conference room mm -hmm. and then i'm able to walk them out of our meeting and say, you know, this is where we're gonna work on your 3D model. This is where the cool stuff, and then this is where Jesse is going to, to turn your design into construction drawings. And once they're done, we can actually progress into interior design. And by the way, here's Kim, Kat, and Cynthia. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't you guys meet this couple that we just met? And it's a very linear process. Well, walking out of my office is linear, but every project, swerves and dives between each of the people and i'm able to illustrate that to them it was like a uh a gantt chart mm -hmm. right showing how like if you get to this milestone now you jump to these guys and you, and the closer to the door the closer you are to building so thank you for uh, <laughs> making that comment it was it was well intentioned honestly so so tell me then what inspired you to leave the comforts of employment and go and do the crazy thing of setting up your own architecture practice and you know what how were you winning those projects in the early days so all right there's a couple of things there i was not employable Mm -hmm. um, I did not want a business and certain days I still don't. Uh, I decided, you know, I, I'm not an egotist. I, I wasn't leaving because I wanted my own ideas or my design or more money even because I was convinced that there would not be more money. Mm -hmm. At the very least, I would go out and try to make what I'm making. And when I first started, uh, I would literally even down to having an employee, my first employee I would leave on Fridays and go wait tables on Friday night and Saturday night at an Italian restaurant. Wow. Um, and there were many times that that, you know, that's where I got my money from mm -hmm. because you're just trying to figure everything out. And to get work was difficult because I graduated in 06. So I just finally got my feet wet. 08 hits and yeah. everything absorbed. Um, 
And I was, I'm determined, still determined to do everything with the most integrity possible. Mm-hmm. So I didn't pawn off the work I did at other places as mine. My, I did a website. The website would basically tell you about me. I wish I had you write that for me because <laughs> it would have been way better than what I did. Um, and I'd have to go in and sell my ideas and sell myself and not mm-hmm. a portfolio. And I did it. You know, I, I find myself very relatable to people because I think it's important to listen. Mm-hmm. Um, I, it's really not hard, in my opinion, to win a person over in a lead meeting. My goal is to get a scope from them, Mm -hmm. a schedule, and a budget. If I boiled everything down to those three, Mm -hmm. and I repeat that back to them, and I give them options to meet all of those, you can't lose. At that point, it's just what is your price relative to your competition? Mm -hmm. What are you offering? So in the early days, I had to offer the bare minimum because compared to my competition, I was 30, I was 30 years old. I'm 40 now. I was 30 years old. And I even had a client once say that to me. He's like, you know, your prices are lower than everybody else. Your all of your competition is white haired. Mm -hmm. I'm nervous to go with you. I said, well, you're hiring me. You like me because I'm young. Mm -hmm. So I can't have gray hair and be young at the same time. You want the innovative ideas. And I don't have a bunch of clients. Mm -hmm. Um, And then shortly I had a bunch of clients and then I needed somebody to help me. Right. And then that's when it changed, right? Like you don't realize it. I didn't realize it, but I became so much more responsible. Mm -hmm. Um, I had to worry about bookkeeping and timesheets. Right. And at the time it was all me, right? So like I'd have this Excel spreadsheet that I'd fill out every, it's the most backwards antiquated way. And then I'd review my guys' timesheets. And then eventually, and I would do it so that I went through my account and my account would tell me how much to take out in taxes. Then I would write the net pay handwrite on the check mm-hmm. and then give it to him and he'd go cash it. And he was coming to my house. Um, fast forward to today where you walk through, we're now 20 plus um, with multiple disciplines. I still have to do all of the little things right that I did myself. Mm-hmm. I just now have people that do it way better than me yeah. doing it. And I want that on display. Like you notice it's an, oh, I could have done a bunch of cubicles. I could mm-hmm. have done a bunch of smaller rooms. That's not really reflective of the architecture process. Well, what was the growth like in the business? You know, you're, you're saying you're 20 people now, you started off basically as a sole practitioner. Was it, did it come in surges or has it been a kind of consistent, slow growth? And was there a, was there a pivot point in terms of the caliber of projects that you were dealing with that you kind of suddenly went from, you know, doing rear extensions or little bits of kind of renovation work to now, you know, these pretty epic new build houses all over the, all over the state. I think part of it is I haven't, I haven't turned my back to anything. So there are filler projects, right? Sometimes you need projects that are not going to take you six months to do or Mm -hmm. eight months to do. So if it fits and it's a good, if it's a good connection with that client and it hits those three to schedule the price, and, and the compatibility, we're gonna do it. Um, it was, it's, I don't wanna say it was uncontrolled, but in the beginning, I always hired because I needed help, which means I was late, mm-hmm. and which means that I was rushing the hiring process. Um, and it was from, from a conservative aspect. You know, I, I just wasn't sure if I could take on another person. I didn't, I wasn't sure if I would be able to handle the overhead. Um, now it's controlled because the demand is there. Um, if I could, I, I could probably double the amount of staff with the amount of leads that we have waiting in a queue, the bandwidth, we could finely tune the number of big jobs versus small jobs. But at a certain point, it's too, too much stress. Like mm-hmm. I, to a degree, the amount of success you have is relevant to the amount of stress you can take on. Mm-hmm. And for where I'm at right now, a lot of it's new to me. Mm-hmm. I've been doing it for 10 years, been doing it for 10 years prior to that. But the idea of doing a luxury house, the first one, which was probably five or six years ago, was a successful undertaking. Now doing five at the same time with an interior design team. There's too much discovery. I would be incredibly irresponsible if mm-hmm. I grew any further than this. That's a, that's a very interesting perspective, actually. And, you know, I think you 
you know, when you first take on a project, there is this massive learning curve and there's a kind of stomach for it. And then there's a point where you've got to be, you've, you've got to be strategic and cautious with how much you're going to take on as learning. And I've seen it before with practices who have taken on projects like, uh, you know, kind of even small parts of airports. That is not a kind of, that's not the kind of work you want to get involved in unless you've got experience in doing it and you know what you're doing because the, 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 the ramifications can be very serious for, for you and for the, you know, and for the, for the client for that yeah. matter. Um, so in, in terms of where you're at now and how the business is structured, let's have a little breakdown of it. You've got 20 people, you've got an interiors department and you've got your architectural production part, uh, department and then you've got a, a pretty sophisticated accounting yes. department as well who, who's looking after everything and you know i was very uh, we were getting very excited this morning about looking what's it called the flash reports the daily flash yeah. yeah so the so the structure is we're about i believe right now it's 26 total mm -hmm. with interns and part-time uh, that's made up of a receptionist office manager, an executive assistant for me, which is the, the key for me, um, a bookkeeper and a controller. So that's our administrative staff. Then we've got five full-time interior designers and one full-time renderer that only handles the interior design division and one part-time renderer. Mm -hmm. um, and then the balance is in architecture. So at the core, we're designers, right? Architecture is my profession, mm -hmm. but I realized that in order to complete a job the way I want, because I could complete it at architecture, there was this gap. The gap was like, really, an architect, you give somebody the plans, they can't even really bid it. Let's mm -hmm. be realistic. Uh, to get a true bid set, you need everything. And our major problem in building is the word allowances. Mm -hmm. Um, if you don't drill down those allowances, you really don't know what you're getting. So my process is architecture, bid it, approve the project, mm -hmm. approve the budget, give me the allowances, and let's do interior design now. Right. So what that means is a person can now go to one place and not have to worry about filling in any gaps. It's a mm -hmm. ton of responsibility because it's that old one neck to ring. Yeah. It's this neck. <laughs> and I feel like it gets wrong a lot um, because it's a construction. It, nothing is predictable. Mm -hmm. And where I reside is luxury, which essentially means custom, which means we have a format, we have a template, we have the roadmap, whatever you want to use. We're going to get you to the finish line. But every project is slightly different because every client's needs are different. Yeah. Communication, right? Design, bid, build. That's what we learn in school. You're going to design it, you're going to bid it, you're going to build it. That's really a communication model. Mm -hmm. And you're requiring on most builders that really don't know that because they didn't have the formal training. Most builders that I work with, they were a tradesperson that got tired of being a tradesperson, thought they could be a construction manager, and that's how they've gone that route. So the idea of design, bid, build as a three word means nothing. To a client, it's even further away because right. maybe the builder heard it once before. What, what we've done is we've turned, and this is what you were noting about our space, we've turned those words into a visible process. Mm -hmm. And we're, the buck is stopping with us. Like we're, I'm sure we, you've talked about this before, the architect is the master builder, mm -hmm. right? That's where this started. And then it got boiled down to a specialty. I'm trying to go back to the other I, I want to give people a complete package that enhances their life. And that's not a sales pitch, right? Yeah. It's like, what do you need? I want to know, are you, is, are you left-handed or right-handed? Or where's the dishwasher going? Mm -hmm. Do you like sun? Do you not like sun? Because I'm going to put your bedroom where you want to be and down to every item. And if I'm not the interior designer as well, which I am on 10% of my projects, those are the projects that are most successful. Interesting. And you, I mean, why did you start the interiors department? I mean, this it's was a, a terrible <laughs> reason. It's an absolutely horrific reason. When I first started, I had no work and I couldn't. I remember my first project mm -hmm. that I probably would have had to charge for the level of service easily 40 to 50 grand today. Right. And I was probably 3,700. Right. So out of my basement with no employee. 
And when I tell you daily site visits, it's remarkable, right? How how far I've grown. I Is it amazing of, when you think back? And you, oh, think you think what you were doing for thirty seven hundred dollars? Yeah, and and the extra was not. Sadly, it wasn't appreciated. Sure, you know that that that's a whole different discussion. But the carrot for me, and what made me care so much, was like I needed this in my portfolio. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm walking through people like how embarrassing at this point but when i'm going on meetings i'm showing floor plans <laughs> of this house to people that's so boring um so i wanted photos and i'm we're done and there was a gap between you, you there's a point in every project no matter how good we are no matter how good the contractor is they just the client mm -hmm. wants to be done and almost the smaller the project the quicker that happens because they're living through so finally it took me months to get them to agree to have me photograph the house. Not because they were mad, just because it was like, we're done, like, all right, we'll figure it out. Yeah, please let us know, we're, we're happy. We're busy, we've got stuff, the kids are yeah. blah, blah, blah. So I show up and not only did they not give a, a damn about me coming, like literally it's as if they destroyed the house before I could come, like I couldn't possibly take a photo, mm -hmm. but the walls were, the backsplash in the kitchen was orange. I don't care how good the orange, there's no way that's photographing in my portfolio. Yeah. And I realized that, all right, I gotta like either out, align myself with an interior designer or, and I tried that a little bit, but it never was seamless because mm -hmm. inevitably there is a power struggle. And my power struggle happens to be when I did something, I completed it. I completed it to my client's needs. Mm -hmm. And now the designer's coming in not worrying about the client's needs. So I don't really care about me. I care about the client and the client's project. Yeah. I actually care about the client's project less than the client. So I would go into these projects and I'd have this alignment and all of a sudden where we had this beautiful view is now a range. Mm -hmm. Like because the kitchen they felt would be a better layout. Now you can't see the backyard. Well, didn't you guys care about lighting? Yeah, but the designer told us, and it was great because the builder told us we could use that window in the attic. So we didn't even have to throw out the window. Like, this is real. This is this is what I was dealing with. And I said, you know what? I have to get my my foot in there. And it was, it was like the 3,700 all over again because mm -hmm. now I'm giving away interior design for free. Mm -hmm. The first year and a half, I, I lost double the amount that I charged in interior design because as an architect we're not classically trained yeah okay so the interior industry where i live there's two types there's us mm -hmm. and others like us where they do drawings and models and there's types that they say well there's three tile when the client doesn't know that these are the three tiles that we've done and so if it's, so we're we were bidding against that and i had it prove to people listen i could do it all mm -hmm. but i was charging the lesser amount but performing the higher service I needed to get four or five years into that before I can really show we are luxury all inclusive. Now I've got the interior design portfolio. Now I've got the architecture portfolio. Um, it's just uh, fortunately and knock on wood, it's come down to whether or not I have the time to take on the project right. and they have the time to wait. And I don't mean that in, a, mm. in an arrogant way whatsoever. One of the things, my the biggest complaint I get right now about this because I have somebody that I'm paying exclusively to pick up the phone. Mm -hmm. I have somebody, my assistant, to make sure that I'm able to give my jobs the time that they need. Yeah. That's instruction that comes from our PPS and our studio director. And she's telling clients that are calling, asking me, it's part of a real estate deal. We need you in a week or two weeks. And she's saying, I'm really sorry. He can't go because he's got these obligations to his current clients. And the people that are wise respect that mm -hmm. and they wait. And the other ones that can't, they'll um, move on. Yeah. And believe it or not, I do get a lot of people that go forward with another architect and it's not working. And then they've, it's like they've had a, I don't know, the best, like a come to Jesus, they say. <laughs> this isn't working. He, we know he's highly referred. Let's go with them. Mm -hmm. And I hate that the he is highly referred because there's 20 plus people. I am the face, I've become the face, whatever. It's all of us. You're hiring my business, plan yeah, architecture. It's the team, yeah. It has to be. We are taught, and 
I feel like I, I probably sound like I'm absolutely against the pedagogy of architectural schools. I, I'm not. But like my favorite architects were Luke Kahn, Frank Lloyd Wright, Tadeo Amdo. I'm thinking it's that those three men. Mm -hmm. It's a total, total embarrassment mm -hmm. that we've been led to think that we one person. Every house we touch is three, four thousand people. Like if you really trace it all the way down the line to the suppliers. Yeah, the supply chain, that's the what I'm complexity, saying. there's just in this massive amount of interconnectedness with the people that are involved. It's in an it. absolute it's amazing that anything ever gets built. Yeah. You know, we are I'm always in I'm trying to justify, mm -hmm. right? I'm trying to justify time and fees. And we usually boil it down to real estate, right? I've embraced the fact that I'm in the real estate field because you just can't separate the one from the other. Mm -hmm. um, I, mean, that, I mean, that's quite a pertinent mindset shift. That, that was the turning point for me. When I recognized that I'm the, I'm the essential part of a real estate transaction to go successfully and everyone benefit. And let mm -hmm. me say what that means, right? I am the person that can sell a house that is underperforming to a person that can't find the house because there's nothing out there. Make the buyer happy, the seller happy, the real estate agent happy. The real real estate agents come to me, Dan, I just got this property. You know anybody that's looking? No, but I just got this call. I can't tell you. It's twice a week, three times a week. And in fact, I was just asked this week to do a presentation for KW Luxury. So right. I had 20 realtors that had done 23 in 2020, uh, $1 billion worth of sales mm -hmm. in the tri-state area. And they're, t they're asking why, are, why they're in an architecture. It doesn't make any sense. I'm in the real estate game. And when you're in luxury, because that's where I'm at now, the only thing that matters is what the client wants. Mm -hmm. How can we enhance their lives? No one, it, it used to be I'd go to, I'd go to a, a lead and the reason I was there is because they need a bedroom upstairs. Right. Okay. Or my wife would like a porch. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going in and I'm saying, well, what do you want? Well, my wife wants, well, no, what are you trying to achieve? Mm -hmm. You want the ability to see out the front? Well, does it really need to be a porch? You know, if I just did a wall of glass here, it's only you're give, you're getting what you want. Oh, I didn't really think of that. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, you know how you mentioned that you're tired of being in the kitchen and your parties in there. Well, if I just rotated your kitchen and which the average person doesn't think of, a real realtor doesn't, everybody thinks of like knock down a wall, but when you just move things around, mm -hmm. that's the aha. And that's what I live for. Right? Yeah. I love the moment that a person feels like they just saw a magic trick mm -hmm. and they're like, I don't know how you do it. Well, it's practice, you know. Yeah. Um, well, that's 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 very interesting. You know, there's the kind of you know the, the magic of the of actual kind of unlocking value inside of a property, and also recognizing that it's part of a larger business transaction that is happening. When you put, kind of start putting it in that context, old already the architectural service is more highly valued. Now it's a kind of business proposition as opposed to something aesthetic. Um, and it also, but the way that you're talking here is you, you know, you're very good at being able to ascertain or understand what the problems are of a client that they're having, and then being able to kind of sell into that. And that's kind of how you're framing the package of work that you're doing. A hundred percent. We are, people are, we're in the realm of HGTV meets Pinterest meets Instagram mm -hmm. reels. Right. So I have to tell people, pretend that I'm like, I'm a tour guide. And tell me like what type of food you like and what interests you entertainment wise. And then I'm going to get you the best restaurant and the best theater. Mm -hmm. it, the other analogy is like, you don't go to the doctor and tell him that you have pneumonia. You go there and you tell him like, listen, I'm a little lethargic. My breath, like, let me an analyze what you need. Cause you probably don't need as much as you do. Mm -hmm. Or I could just cut to the, the chase, right? What you're looking to do is not going to happen at this property but there's a property here that's mm -hmm. undervalued. You don't realize it, but if I just do two things there, it'll be the same amount of money you would put in here, but you'll have a larger property on the nicer side of town. Mm -hmm. These are standard conversations. We, we, we're we remiss, we're, we're missing it if we don't mm -hmm. say that. And 
it was a hard pill for me to swallow, but I, I had a bunch of projects that I did that people were cutting so much out of it because it didn't make sense. So now I start my lead meetings where a client might call me and say they want to do a substantial renovation in addition. Right. I make it a point. It doesn't matter what their budget is. It doesn't, it, nothing matters. I tell them whatever we do here, it's going to make zero financial sense. And that's the point where I get the eye. Well, what do you mean? I said, well, you probably think this is going to be two or $300,000 worth of, yes. The last one of this was like four fifty five hundred. assuming no, now, <laughs> right. So now your $900,000 house is going to be worth, you're going to be 1.4 into it. Is it going to be worth one, two? No, I could just buy the house over there. That house is one, two. Well, what are you going to do to that house? Well, that's going to be three or 400,000. Not, I don't need all of this, but I need a new kitchen. I need the, mm-hmm. all right. So now we've got a level set, right? You just dist- determine that for what you want, that's going to be between one, one and one, three. Mm-hmm. Now, if you stay here, you're over investing, but you're now in the world of luxury and nobody wants to hear that because they're, oh, I'm, I, this is just, I'm only putting in this. I don't have the money to be, well, you are right. Because if I told you you're buying a Lamborghini and you're going to pay $250,000 for it, you are going to willingly buy that 250 and you're going to drive off the lot and you're going to know it's now 180. <laughs> you accepted that. But you're doing the same thing because you're getting a new house. Yeah. You're getting everything new. And instead of the Lamborghini where we just buy this thing and it's been assembled, we got to buy individual parts. We mm-hmm. have to buy studs and wires because it makes total sense when you accept it that way. A renovation is luxury. Mm-hmm. It's not necessity. Mm-hmm. You may need more space, but you may not need it the way. That, so now I've embraced that. I'm a luxury That's architect. That's so refreshingly honest as well. It's the truth. Where, where I, you know, as architects, we're always trying to, you know, obscure the, what the investment is in design on a house. And the reality of it is, you know, you, you invest loads of money in renovating your house. You're not going to get it back immediately unless you bought the property. You know, look at what investors do. They buy property below market value. That's where they make their money. Right. And then they do a few little tricks and then they can. But they're, they're coming from a place of they've made their money in the in the purchase. This is a luxury service a luxury investment right. if you like and it's going to take a little while before you're going to see any of that back if at all right so i a hundred percent and i'm going to go one step further right because we have some developers that hire us mm-hmm. right they buy the distressed property they're mm-hmm. buying it under market and then they hire us and maybe we're twenty thousand dollars more than the next architect mm-hmm. Why are we? Because we're doing renderings, because I'm integrating interior design. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'm not doing the whole interior design package, but I'm the guy that's figuring out where the door's going, and that bedroom's going to have a bed and a TV and make sure nothing, like everything's thought of. You're not just getting a series of bedrooms every time. And, it, you know, the last four sales in our area were above market, didn't even appraise, but sold. Mm-hmm. Not because my name was attached to it. We were at the point now where our name is appearing in real estate listings. That, right next to granite countertops, which is the best feeling in the world. Um, but it's not because of that. It's because we're thoughtful. I'm thinking of, I'm figuring out how to make a 5,000 square foot house look like eight mm-hmm. by not making it deep and stretching it, maximizing the yard. I'm doing all of the things that you could get a, a standard plan off the internet. And if I'm competing against that, I, I'm like, that's fine. Mm-hmm. It's not my client. That's not, and there's plenty of people that want that service. And when you boil it down, and I just said it, the difference is about 20 grand. Mm -hmm. In the scale of a project that you're about- It's minimal. It's zero. It's minimal, yeah. It's it's nothing. If you you fold it into the the mortgage, it's like $40 a month, $50 a month that you're you're putting the value Mm -hmm. of better design. When when you think of a room, trim. Trim is what makes a space better. It's not the, the main cost. The finishes, it's the the lipstick. that, And that's what's always cut out. And that's what's so frustrating, right? Mm-hmm. Like if you have a 750 budget for something that's 900, I'd rather you have a 750 budget for something that's 700. And you'll be proud of it. And you'll want to show it off. And we try to educate people on this. It's Groundhog Day. It's mm-hmm. like I watch people. They go through it. Some listen, some don't. I get to the end. I got to have the conversation. We talked about it. And then later in the day, I'm at day one with another couple. So yeah. it's, it's hard it's for again, again, and it's again, again and again. Yeah. And it's the same thing. Well, let's, let's talk about, we'll, we'll talk, we'll come back more to this idea of kind of luxury and luxury experience as well. Um, and serving luxury clients. Um, but 
just going back to the way that the business is actually structured, because I was very impressed with, you've got, I don't want to use the word production line, but there was a production line yeah. in there and it was very efficient. And can you just t walk us through Absolutely. How, how these different departments are working, how work is actually being delegated and operated on and why it's so efficient? Okay, so we have a true structure in the office. So at the top is the CEO, which is me. Mm -hmm. And then we've got architecture, interiors, and controller. Mm -hmm. The controller is the key, right? They're the person that's helping me project. They're the ones that are saying, all right, with our current staff and our current workload, we're looking at five months worth of work. That's the most important because if I get to the point where I'm seven or eight, I either have to hire somebody or stop taking work. Um, I have a milestone for deposits, which means I have a milestone every month for the amount that I have to get under contract. I have a milestone payment or a budget, I should say, for achieving design approvals. Mm -hmm. We call that operations fixed. So our contractors are structured in a flat fee basis with percentages assigned to milestone based on the scope. So I know that I have to achieve X number of dollars that month for the between the 15th and the first and then the 15th and the and the 30th so front end back end inevitably we have some hourly contracts i have a budget for that for each of my interior design teams they have a budget that they have to achieve both in fixed mm -hmm. and then it all adds up at the bottom and we publish internally something we call a daily flash and what that does is it tells me how i'm doing okay so if we're behind on deposits but we're ahead on construction drawings we can make adjustments and without that document and the people to create that document, mm -hmm. you're getting all of this information way too late. And common thing that I, I'm asked is, well, what's the hardest thing or what's the most important thing? And it's a bunch of little things. There's no one important thing. Mm -hmm. The problems I have today in plan architecture are never architecture. Mm -hmm. It's never design. It's never the dimension is wrong because I have fail safes. There are people that are there to just do what they do. Yeah. The problems are managing schedule, managing client expectations, and sadly sometimes managing employee expectations. And it's the people part. That's, yeah. that's the part that I enjoy, but it's also the most difficult. Yeah. Because you can never pin it down. I can't be pinned down. I'd be lying if I said what I thought was important to me three months ago is still important to me mm -hmm. today. Because the nature of, of, we have principles, but I might have been wrong on something three months ago. And I'm so focused on getting that better that something else falls Pops off. out, yeah. It does. Yeah. Because all, there's this uh, misconception in multitasking that, when, that you can make everything urgent. You really can't. Mm -hmm. You can believe that you are. And that's what I learned in this process. I could blow, let, let's say I wanted to just have a record month and land the most contracts I ever did. What does that serve? It serves ego, mm -hmm. but it doesn't help me run a business. Mm -hmm. So if I have hit that milestone, the one we were looking, we hit the milestone for the month, but I'm behind on projection, on, on, our, on our production projection. So now what does that mean? That means that I have to do a little more, bit more red lines. Mm -hmm. I might have to stop somebody before they went a little too far and course correct. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, and this goes back to like, why is it 20 and why is it, I can't do any more than that right now. Mm -hmm. I need to get my staff to the next level, which I've outlined and we have reviews the reviews are coming up. They keep getting pushed back like any other architecture firm. Um, but we are identifying roles for each person and how do they fill each of these roles in that machine? Mm -hmm. So, so when we're looking at the actual production line or the, the machine, the mechanics mm -hmm. of the machine, you've got a group of people whose sole role really is producing construction documentation drawings and they're doing detailing. Yeah. And that's a kind of body of knowledge. And so all projects, when they're at that phase, go through this team. Yes. And then you've got a team who's kind of involved in more the schematics and the planning. And then obviously you've got interiors later on. And then yourself, you're involved. You're that's the kind correct. of golden thread all the way through. If you yes. Like. So every project is assigned me mm -hmm. and a project architect. Right. Um, there are some projects, more of our development work, that will go straight to a project architect. Right. Okay. Um, I'm servicing the luxury clients, but there's a, it's not a large division. There's a division of our office, which is high-end design, but production line. Right. Okay. 
the the average project, 90% of them are the luxury. So they start with me and one of my three project architects. Mm -hmm. In the meetings is me and the project architect. In the office is the project architect with production staff, right? which is split, okay? So it used to be when I had less people, less projects, we would stay with the project and the person doing the architectural design and the modeling would then do construction drawings. Mm -hmm. That the but limiting- That's the traditional kind of- That is of. traditional, but I'm at the point where I've got some people that don't know how to use 3D. Yeah. They're, they're in the business for 30 years and I'm, I hate to say it, but like a lot of firms are cutting that person out, that mm -hmm. talent out of the industry because they just want the flash. I don't want that. I want the expertise. Mm -hmm. If I have somebody that knows how to detail a single family home and has been doing it for 30 years, who am I to try to get them to start doing? It's ridiculous. Yeah, they've got that. They've got an incredible amount of construction knowledge, which is so sort of And guess elusive, who doesn't know how to put a building together? The person that knows the 3D program. Mm -hmm. So let's put them on the front end. Now, I'm not pigeonholing people. It's very important to me that my staff comes to me and feel feels like they're getting out of the profession what they want to. Mm -hmm. I might be able to tell them, listen, I want to get you there. Let's create a path for you to get there. By and large, when people are doing something they're good at, they love it more. And I don't have much of that pigeonhole. I might have had that one time in the past where a person felt like they were just doing too, too many models. Right. And then you've got to look at whether or not they are good at that, mm -hmm. right? So I have to be a like a band leader to a degree. Like everybody wants to be the singer, but if you're a better guitar player and the other person is better singer, you, you don't want that person up in front of the band. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I've had to balance that. And what I've learned is zoning, for instance. I have one guy in my office who does all the zoning. His name is Frank. He was my first employee. So like I... He was in my basement when I had my daughter. We came home. He's the first person to meet my daughter t uh, nine years ago. And over time, he's, he's so good at getting to black and white mm -hmm. uh, in a very gray world. And he's created relationships with zoning officials. And he, you know, he knows that that zoning official, even though the code says one thing, calculates building height another way. You know how much time that saves me by being wrong in the future? Because... The, I used to submit projects, follow the code, and then they say, oh, yeah, we don't use that. Well, what do you mean you don't use it? Mm -hmm. You think this little architect is going to change it? No. Now i got to go back to the drawing board. There's no one to charge. It's, it's a lot. It's just more efficient. I have Jesse in my office. His main purpose there, his main priority is taking calls from building departments mm -hmm. and contractors. Because those are two sectors that, again, we don't talk about this in, in architecture school, that need qualified architects to be on call. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hear that we're holding up the project. I don't want to hear that um, the drawings were rejected because because we do, we get building officials that reject us for something. Well, we get the letter, now Jesse can say, all right, well, according to this section of the code, it's only supposed to do this. Oh, I didn't see that on your drawing. Mm -hmm. Or they may raise something to us and now Jesse is responsible for making sure every single project has that. One of the things that recently came up was um, the kitchen hoods. Right. Over 400 CFMs, you have to have makeup there. Some towns are forced, but some towns don't. Sometimes there's a discrepancy. But now, when that was adopted, every single set of plans has that. The level or the amount of rejections we get are pretty slim. I often get people, at, people will ask me, you know, you're not the local architect. Because our when we first started, I had like five towns that I worked mm -hmm. in. But since we're providing a service that's a little bit different, we're more desired and branching out of that area. And what I say to them is, you know, I've got full-time people. We're going to be on top of it. Yeah, there's probably some inherent knowledge that that building, that architect knows. But I now see turnaround in building officials. Mm -hmm. I see turnaround in zoning officials so that legacy knowledge may not be there. And why did you call me? Because you don't like the houses that that architect did mm -hmm. or the builders did. So we may get a little it, bit. It's, it's, so, it's so nicely, you know, efficient when you've got kind of people with those specialized bodies of knowledge in the office and you're kind of, you know, th there you go. That's what you're, you're, you're looking after that. And, yeah. and as well as and what you're saying as well is that making sure that it's something that they do love doing as well. So, you know, if they, so they don't feel like they're just being pigeonholed. Right. But then you're also lifting somebody up. And I think that's, that's very honest and enlightening 
when you're starting to allow people to kind of develop their bodies of expertise, it also means when people start developing bodies of expertise like that, they can get paid more, the business becomes more efficient. You know, you've you've pinpointed some very key parts of the process there where you're losing time or losing inefficiency. So actually having the business orientated around solving that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I, I want to go back to... We were talking about this earlier as well, mm-hmm. about the milestone billing. Yes. And milestone billing for me is normally kind of red flags for lots of you know architects because if you're billing on milestones, most architects practices are run very badly and any kind of thing that is outside of your control, normally a client making a decision or planners rejecting approval or building inspectors having too many questions or contractors not knowing what they're doing or engineers Mm -hmm. making mistakes. All of that, which is outside of your office, can suddenly derail your deadline to meeting and completing a milestone, which now means your invoicing targets are off, which now means your cash flow is impacted, which means your bank account is not what you were expecting. So... But you guys are still doing milestone billing. How do you mitigate against all of that crazy risk? Yeah. Well, first of all, not well. That's that's an honest truth. Right. Um, second of all, we always get the milestone. Mm-hmm. Okay. So with proper planning, mm-hmm. I am, if I don't get it this month, I will fill that void with something else right. to hit what I need to. Remember how I said we're checking in? Yeah. If I see that I had a client, this is God's honest truth. They had, they wound up getting pregnant. Mm -hmm. That kicked us all the way back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. They needed more bedrooms and we were able to work something out. A big thing for me. And I know that this is like second marker against architects. I don't charge for revisions. Mm -hmm. As long as you go in a linear process, I'm not going anywhere, right? Mm-hmm. If you tell, if you don't approve my bubble diagram telling me that the kitchen's on the left side and the bedrooms are on the right, I'm not going to you drafting, showing three versions in a 3D model. So the amount of revisions that you could make at each stage, I control that. Yeah. A person does not want to hear, in order for me to get what I want, you're going to bill me more because it's a revision. Mm-hmm. We, and this is why all of this is working and everything that you just said I'm not an architect. I'm delivering a project. Mm-hmm. So like if I was looking at it as in terms of I'm being compensated for drawings, then I wouldn't be concerned with uh, building department comments. I, I'm not che- I don't even want to get hired for construction administration. I want you to pay me to do a great set of drawings that minimizes the amount of mistakes or unknowns. Mm-hmm. There's nothing better than that because no contractor plans ahead and says, I'm going to need this architect's answer in three weeks. It's always right then and there. So the milestone, it's scary, but it's, it's people feel good Mm -hmm. paying when they've accomplished something. Yeah. Not because somebody worked on their project for 60 hours Mm -hmm. last month. And I think that that changes the the relationship Mm -hmm. between you and the client. I said that I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. I've done it. You said that you're going to pay me for it. Mm -hmm. It never, every time that I ever had an hourly billing, Mm -hmm. it ended in an argument. Yeah. And the argument was, well, you showed me three options. They don't remember that they changed their mind or they don't realize that the reason I couldn't show them exactly what they wanted was because that setback from the side yard was 10 feet Mm -hmm. and they thought we had eight. They just remember they don't want to pay me for something they're not going forward Mm -hmm. with. But I spent the time. So I'd rather bake in the extra time. Knowing it's a risk. Some some jobs to this day, I'm doing this for 10 years, mm-hmm. I blow it. Mm-hmm. I thought it was going to be $10,000 worth of my time. It was 18. Dust myself off and move yeah. on. I don't dwell on it because yeah. you just have to win more than you lose. So, so in terms of protecting cash flow you know, with, with milestones, you, you guys take some money up front? Before. So yeah, it depends on the size of the project. Right. Um, I try to get I try to get enough up front mm-hmm. that it carries me to the next milestone. Right. Okay. So yeah, I have a deposit. I'm ahead of the client. By the time we get the design approval, we're pretty even. Mm-hmm. And then the final milestone is a 20% milestone. And then that's due upon final drawings. Got it. Um, and it, you know, we, we've had a couple people at the end say, well, I don't want to pay until I have permits. Mm-hmm. Well, how does that make sense? You paid me to do drawings. Well, what if I don't, they don't get approved. Well, what if you decide not to build it? Mm-hmm. You don't have permits. Well, you know, it's a certain, you have to sort of, my contract started at three pages and it's 11 now. Right. 
you get more and more specific. Most people at this point don't even read the contract. Yeah. They just, they, somebody used me, the builder's referring me, and it doesn't matter. And the milestones don't matter, right? Mm -hmm. I had, when I first started, I had a mentor tell me he couldn't believe the, the milestones. He's like, this makes no sense. And I have no problem. No one has ever complained to me about a deposit amount or the, the fee structure. Mm -hmm. Cause it's, cause I'm giving them, they're paying me when I've achieved something. I, I yeah. don't think that's hard to, to sell. But, um, how, how else as well then do you, do you control the, the, the kind of making sure that say, for example, you, you spoke about, okay, sometimes you make a mistake. Client has loads of revisions for you. Yeah. You don't normally charge for revisions. How do you mitigate against clients being overly involved in a project? I mean, I was looking at a meme, I think it was this morning, that, that said something like, we design it $500, we design it, you watch $800, yeah. and et cetera, and to the one at the end where it says, you design it, we charge you $3,000. So, so kind of indicating that, you know, actually being a good leader, I mean, I often say this, you know, actually part of your role as an architect is you're leading the design process. We have a bad habit of not, being good at knowing when to integrate the client into the process and also when it's best for the project and best for the client's vision to actually keep the client out of out of their own way. Yeah, so my clients would never be able to be told that. <laughs> it's the reality where I'm, you know, most of my clients are C-class professionals that are never told no. Right. So what I have to do is I have to put on my human hat and not my architect hat or maybe my psychiatrist. And I, I can achieve more talking mm -hmm. than drawing. So why are you revising this? Mm -hmm. Because the room feels small. Well, wh what do you mean it feels small? What, what, what are you trying to do in here? Let's talk through it. You're in your apartment right now. What's the width of your apartment? Let me go get my tape measure. Oh yeah, you're right. So many revisions are managed because the people don't understand what they're looking mm -hmm. at. Like I hear it all the time. That's as like, interesting. Yeah, no, I hear you, and I'm not trying to sell them. Yeah. Tell, if I got it wrong, fine. It takes me no time to move a wall in AutoCAD 12 inches to the left or right. Mm -hmm. And anybody that's billing and complaining about that, and that's going to make you like, we've all know those people that were in off, you're in offices and they're disgruntled drafts people. Mm -hmm. You get that way by like making a big deal out of nothing. Mm -hmm. It's no work. It's 15 minutes of time. And let, let's just say the client keeps doing it. Mm -hmm. I just want to remind you that you wanted to break ground in March. It's February. I'm, I'll design forever with you. I want you to be happy, but this might not be the time for you to make this decision. Mm -hmm. We're going to go into interior design. That's a non-load bearing wall. We could remove the wall if you want. I try to help them make the proper decision at the right time. Mm -hmm. If they're telling me that they think that the living room itself is too small and I need to make the addition, they, then we have to stop. Um, but I also think I do a good job of telling a person where we're at in the process. Right, so they know what the risks right. are and so their, dis their decisions. I start every meeting with what we're going to accomplish in this meeting. Mm -hmm. So in the first meeting, when I'm meeting them, I just want to know you. I want you to know me. I want to know you. I want to understand what you want from this house and what you care for, about from your architect. Mm -hmm. That's like my lead intro. Then the first meeting, I'm going over zoning and we're getting into it. I'm going to ask, I say, I'm going to ask you a hundred questions. It's going to be like a, one of those um, branch diagrams where if you say, yes, I'm going to go this way. You say, no, I'm going to go this way. And we are going to do a little bit of bubbling. We're going to talk about where the house is going to go, which side of the garage is going to go. Why do I need to know? Where the, because I want to know where you want sun. I like to put garages on the north side of the house. Mm -hmm. It just makes a lot of sense. We leave that meeting. I take all their notes. I put it into a program. I assign room sizes. It automatically populates a square footage for me. That square footage gets added up. They want to do a 5,000 square footage. I'm adding up to eight. We have our first conversation because at the end, I give them an idea of what the budget's going to be, right. the construction budget, right. which is, I and I tell them, this could be entirely wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm an architect. What I'm telling you is what my clients have told me. They could have been lying. The contractors, the project could have wound up being more. I'm just giving you data. So the the first design meeting they've approved their program a list mm -hmm. i've got the details i gave them basic sizes i've discussed whether or not we're going to be on budget with money and size yeah now i can get into bubble diagrams mm -hmm. and then i do bubble diagrams and those are literally well, I, I i love this because it, you know and again in a way you're, you're you're using the milestones 
as being like we're we're going somewhere. Yeah. And we've got to get to that milestone and you've you're helping them make decisions effectively and promptly. A hundred because I, I can't tell you how many times I'm in this meeting mm-hmm. and I'm being shown drawers with kitchens. Mm-hmm. I said I show it to me. I want to see what you like. I don't want to I'm not gonna talk about that though. Thank you. We don't need to know about that yet. Well, yeah, because I say to them, why do I need to know what drawers going where if we don't know where the kitchen is? Yeah. You know, and I do the bubble diagram with them. And I, I read, I've read so many books on psychology Mm -hmm. because this is the the, people hate change. People hate making decisions. And that's what this whole thing is about. And there was a book that said that if you, it was based on, I want to say Macy's Macy's did a study. Don't quote me. The gist is this, that when Macy's took a sofa order and immediately put into production, 80% 80% of those orders were canceled. And then when they waited two days, 60%. And then when they waited three days, 40%. But if they waited four days, it went back up to 60%. So what I tell my clients is I email them, I give them drawings, I record a narration so they hear it, what I'm doing. And I say, I'm not doing anything for three days. Mm-hmm. So think about it. And I inevitably get text messages and I inevitably get emails and I inevitably answer them, even though I know there's going to be more Mm -hmm. and I don't really take action Mm -hmm. for two or three days. My time is too valuable to be spent on. And this took me a long time because when I'm in, you're in the service industry, you want to go at their beckoning call. Yeah. You can't, not everything can be the most immediate when, when they've gotten to the point where the, like the questions, the anxiety, it's all down. Now we can have an informed conversation. Mm -hmm. You like the layout, great. You wish the powder room was on the other side of the house, no problem, give me an hour. Send them the bubble diagram. Mm -hmm. Now we know what it looks like. Then we start an exterior schedule. Guys, we're basically, we're on our third round of this, fine with me, you're not getting charged anything extra, but I thought we were gonna achieve this like two or three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So as long as you know that we're still going, and I think it's a terrible, and I tell them this, I think it's a terrible reason to make a decision because you don't you want to start ground break ground in March instead of April. Why? If unless there's like a major mile uh, major deadline which they're never I've never seen one mm-hmm. that I felt was an emergency. Yeah. Never. No, they're always so arbitrary. They are. You know, it, usually people are just like I don't want to have two mortgages. Mm-hmm. Nobody does. Is that a, because you don't want to pay an extra $3,000, you're going to rush a decision mm-hmm. for one month? Whenever you boil it cuz when they rush it, we inevitably wind up redoing things. Yeah. And the later that they bring it up, the more costly it is to them. Yeah. Now, I don't charge for revisions and design, but if you if I finish construction drawings and all of a sudden, oh, I didn't realize we wanted three powder rooms, you only showed two. That's a change. Mm-hmm. That's a that's a substantial change. Mm-hmm. And I want you to be clear about it. I want you to think about that. Mm-hmm. We get that when we're in construction. It's framed out. Well, where's the third powder room? You know, we never talked about that. Where did it go? Now we've got problems, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But I want to give them what they want. They just need to understand at each point what they're up against. Let's talk a little bit about the luxury experience, because this is a niche, like a niche market that you've kind of really, you know, made your mark in here. It's a very difficult, for some practices, this is their aspirations. They never quite get into it. They never actually manage to penetrate develop the networks, but there's also something else, which is creating a luxury experience as an architecture office. Tell us a little bit about how you've been doing that, some of the consultants that you've worked with to kind of you know, create this experience of luxury, not just producing luxury custom homes, but yeah. the experience of working with you is a luxurious one. Yeah, I mean, that's, you, you basically said what I had to achieve. Mm-hmm. I discovered that when I was doing cheap projects and there's no other way for me to say it, yeah. I was a cheap architect and I was providing drawings that were beyond the cheap architect fees. So I had a business problem. So I didn't have the confidence to charge more. I honestly didn't think I was good enough and I probably wasn't. So what did I do? I started to scale back on what I was providing. Wrong. Because the people still wanted the higher service, higher than I was ever providing. Mm -hmm. So then I said to myself, all right, I got to change all of this. I need to cater to the people that can afford what they want. And that that was hard to do and took a long time. 
And it goes back to that real estate perspective. Nobody wants to just throw away money. Mm -hmm. But if there's value, and now the value is every realtor, who is this plan architecture? I was. I remember being told that the, like the legacy architects were trying to figure out who I was. It was truly like out of like a more Martin Scorsese film. They were at a country club. There were like three engineers and architects. Who was this plan architecture? Where did he come from? Like, is he someone's kid? Uh, <laughs> one of them said the exact words came back to me. It'd be really great if he did something and didn't post it on Instagram. <laughs> and then I just blew up Instagram. Like. <laughs> It, I made sure I was everywhere. I was in every real estate office. I have the most understanding family that allows me to to do that because this is as much back to that Frank Lloyd Wright, the Louis uh, Kahn today. This is all my life. Mm. This, what you're seeing is my heart and soul put into work and my money and like at any given time, the credit line on my house is what's funding aspects of my business, I'm all in. Like you mm -hmm. can't get any more all in than I am. The luxury service comes in because I know that that's what people are accustomed to. Mm -hmm. The people, people will pay if they feel value is there. And the value that they're looking for is having somebody that picks up the phone every time. It may not be me. They, I get text messages. I say, listen, if this is urgent, AJ and Jesse are waiting for you. Mm -hmm. If not, I'll call you when I can. And I will, I will call you later in the day or the next morning. I have a person for every part of, I don't need all these people. I don't need all of the space. Mm -hmm. I want it because I want to be able to provide the luxury service that my cust my customers, I have a service consultant. Um, she made her uh, living and her history is with the Ritz Carlton and other luxury brands. She's training my staff on how to communicate, how to talk, how to work. And this is not something new. We started this last March. Yeah. Because I recognize, I, we all know what architects upbringing is and what we make and all mm -hmm. that. We are not accustomed to caviar taste. Mm -hmm. I never had caviar until very recently. <laughs> okay. And it's because a client bought it for me and yeah. I indulge. I don't, I needed to be taught all of this. Mm -hmm. It's a world I'm not familiar with. So recognizing what I didn't know gave me the opportunity to get a leg up I don't, I, that's that's it's that is really enlightened it's really really enlightened because i often i'll often see loads of architects who are in the high net worth world and sometimes they're hating on their own clients like they've got they've got some kind of problem then perhaps they haven't come from the same kind of background mm -hmm. as their clients and there's a a psychological there's just a gripe about it and they don't want to be serving that kind of person well that's a problem if you're yeah. trying to make money out of them because that's really selfish it's, it's not, you know, you're not being an advocate. And then there's people who are of that background and then feel guilty about it. Yeah. And they can't deal with it. And then there's what you're doing was actually being an advocate for that people, for those people and just learning about, like just seeing it as like they're, a, they're an industry and they've got certain trends and culture and ways of communicating. And I think just hiring, you know, someone whose specialism is communication with luxury concierge hotels for an architect, that's, that's a stroke of genius. Well, it's a stroke of genius. I appreciate it, but everything <laughs> that I am doing or have done has mm -hmm. been directly related to an inadequacy that I had. Mm -hmm. And I, I assume at a certain point, I'm going to have to decide when is enough is enough. But the, the, the deep downside me will never, I've got the endless curiosity. I always want to solve problems. Mm -hmm. When something is wrong, and somebody and I've said something's wrong and someone in my in my office hasn't addressed it in like a day, I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. And that's a flaw. And they say it to me, look, you were supposed to do the drawing. I said, yeah, but this is wrong and I need this to be fixed immediately. I care so much about the perception of my office. Mm -hmm. I care about away messages. I had a whole big stink over the holidays because uh, and I don't want to throw staff under the bus, but we I gave staff the opportunity to work or handle your milestones, work extra, do whatever you have to do, take off between the holidays. Mm -hmm. We had too much going on because our whole office got COVID. Out of the 17 that report daily into the office, 15 of us got COVID and we're mm -hmm. out from December 15th through the 20th. Right. That being said, it was a very difficult December that we just came, up, came upon. So I said, listen, I give off Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day. It wound up with three days in between. I said, if you can, get your stuff done, take off. So someone put up the away message that the office is closed between the holidays. Mm -hmm. I lost it. Mm 
Mm -hmm. because the office wasn't closed. I worked. Mm -hmm. Multiple people did work. Multiple people had. I just don't want the perception. I want the perception to be because it's true. Mm -hmm. We are here for you at Mm -hmm. your convenience. It's a a lifestyle enhancing luxury experience you're getting from us. Mm -hmm. And the first part of it is getting my staff to buy into it. Mm -hmm. And then the second part is telling our clients that we've all bought into it. Mm -hmm. And that's what the communication expert, and it's not a cheap endeavor Mm -hmm. either. And she's helping us in so many, she's helping us define roles, right? Mm -hmm. As simple as that organization chart that I showed you, CEO, plan architecture, studio director. uh, If you don't have that, and then a project description to support that, you don't have a structure. Mm -hmm. You may think you have one, but if you can't go reference that, and our problems that we have today is when I'm doing something the project architect is doing, supposed to be doing, and the project architect is, is doing something the, it's so many little pieces. And I know yeah, I'm not being very up. articulate, but unless you have this structure and we hate rules, I hate rules as a designer, you give me a box and the first line I draw is outside of it. Mm-hmm. I need, I for the business to work, I need to forget all of that. Mm-hmm. And we talked about maturity or growing up. I had to put my big boy pen. I have to do more of what I don't want to do mm-hmm. because I run a business than I do what I do want to do, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And the architecting, because I have so many people involved, the architecting is a shorter period of time in my week, but I'm able to really get into it because mm-hmm. someone has done the zoning for me. They've given me a background. I'm able to accelerate the project and that's my role on the job. Mm-hmm. So, everything's compartmentalized as best as it could be. I'm I'm excited for what it's gonna look like next. I don't know what it's gonna look like next, but if we repeated this conversation, I would like to, to say that everything that I have right now, what you see is the foundation that brought me to the next level. Mm-hmm. I just don't know what that is yet. I love it, I love it. Let's talk a, a little bit, just to kind of uh, start wrapping up yeah. the conversation. We're here in this incredible, guitar heaven yes right and one of the things that we actually connected over when we first met was 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 music we've both been in a band um and you know for me my sort of love of business and marketing actually started from being in a band because it was very quickly you start to realize that you know you know it's very unlikely certainly in the last 15 20 years that you're going to get picked up by a major label and you know them do everything for you and there's a bit of a kind of you know as a musician musicians just want to focus on the music and do the music but you've got us you've got product to sell you've got to fill up the room sometimes you get bands who are just naturally charismatic and they cause all sorts of commotion and they're performative and you know they can attract mm-hmm. you know they they can Great attention, right. right? The Red Hot Chili Peppers, for example, a good example of that back in the 80s was just kind of... This ca- is my ca- band. Do you know it, that this is my band? No, I didn't. They're my absolute... John Frusciante, my absolute f- most favorite guitar player mm-hmm. because he like toned down Jimi Hendrix. By and large, the pe- Peppers should not be popular, mm-hmm. but they are. And there's an... In- I'm cutting you off. And I'm sorry <laughs> for that. I'm just so excited. I just saw them for the first time this past summer. And oh, it, wow. was, it was the best. It was the best show. It was like religious for me. Go ahead. I'm sorry. You well, were, no, you- were, they, were they, they, you know, they, they're a band that's of, of very kind of unusual musical styles. It's kind of like nothing else that really exists. And certainly their earlier stuff. But they were very good. And they would never have called themselves marketeers. No one ever called them marketeers. But what they were doing was marketing. Yeah. Right. They were good at being able to create a buzz or, and I guess the, the word of it is, there was a kind of element of controversy as well. This is what a lot of musicians, they're, they're good at creating controversy. It creates attention, which means that people end up going and seeing the gigs. I mean, but that's by the by. For you, being in a band, your musical past, what were some of the lessons that you learned there about business, marketing, promotion that you found really useful so the fact that I'm the CEO and founder of Plant Architecture, you know how successful I was <laughs> in the music industry. Um, so I was in a band and we were a local band that did a little bit of touring, nothing crazy, um, minor record deals. Not Again, I'm not overselling what it was, but it was a business. A band is a business. And what I learned in that experience was that you need organization, you need an objective, right? 
a band can go out to make beautiful music. Mm -hmm. And they beautiful music is what they're determining, generally musicians. Most of the Chili Pepper stuff is unlistenable from the early days. I hate to say it. Anthony Kiedis had trouble with his, he still has vocal trouble. He's not uh, melodic. He's not a singer. No. Mm. Uh, you know, and Rick Rubin came in and fixed that. Mm -hmm. um, if they weren't willing to chase the fame, and I'm, I'm not sure if there's a book out there, but I've read Kiedis' book and Flea's book. They both wanted to be famous. Mm -hmm. They may not say it explicitly, but Anthony Kiedis in particular would have given up anything to get fame. So I don't, I think that this is a negative word with a negative connotation only because people are jealous, but the word sellout, mm -hmm. you need to choose whether you want to create music or architecture that is true to your soul mm -hmm. or marketable. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, I needed to choose marketable architecture mm -hmm. very early in my career because I knew that in order for me to achieve what I needed to do, I needed to get a following. Mm -hmm. So I like a band gets people to come buy tickets. Mm -hmm. Once I had enough of a following, now I could start inserting that corner window mm -hmm. or thinking about all the wall of glass. You can't do that unless you have the following. And I say this, like you take a band like the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Like I think that the Chili Peppers, the last three albums sound the same. And I think that they're getting in a good way, mm -hmm. right? Like anything before Californication, it was more funk, mm -hmm. right? And then you had Under the Bridge on... Uh, but trivia, sex yes, music. exactly. You had, but it was Soul to Squeeze. I think right. that's one of the most beautiful songs ever written. You would never think that the band three albums prior wrote that. And you probably wouldn't know that like, Black Summer, mm -hmm. the song that came out in the middle of COVID, was written by the same band. But it somehow was relevant. Mm -hmm. The Beatles did this, right? The Beatles reinvented themselves over and over. I think psychedelics had a hell of a lot to do with that. <laughs> but the reality is, is that what was working 20 years prior, what they were chasing, mm -hmm. evolved. It changed. And that's when it, you become a trendy architect, mm -hmm. right? Like, I hate, just as much as any other architect, the White House with the black windows. I liked it in the beginning. I think it's a little trite. I think it's gotten ruined. Mm -hmm. We're that's where we are. Like it's like trying to chase. If I were in the music business today, I would be trying to chase. I feel like I'm a little re irrelevant with rock. So, pardon the example, like Ed Sheeran. Mm -hmm. I, Ed Sheeran is a great performer, but not a like. I'm sure he's a great guitar player. If we were sitting with him, he could probably outplay me. Yeah, but that's not what's selling. The record labels are telling him what to put on an album. Mm -hmm. So I have to look at the projects that are coming in. I could show every client a cantilever off the side of a cliff or for no reason, just mm -hmm. make something hang. That's on me and I'm going to lose every time. So you mm -hmm. got to like understand what's marketable yeah. and then share that, right? The other part of it is when you were in a band, what I would do to get people to come out to shows is I would print up flyers and I would go to the mall. And I would hand them out to anybody that looked like they might listen to rock music. <laughs> That's no different than Instagram, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm every day that I post something, that's a flyer. And I'm asking, instead of come see my band, I'm saying, can you follow me? Mm -hmm. Can you see what we're doing? Mm -hmm. With the hopes that one day you'll hire me to play music at your house yeah. or a party, which is what we would have loved to have done when we were kids. Yeah. When it comes to the band itself, right? Our first show, we still talk about it. It was so embarrassing. I was a rhythm guitar and lead. I was mostly lead, but the rhythm guitar player that sang, he broke a string. It was our first show. And instead of like just pretending it didn't break, he walks off stage to fix the string. And we're out there playing. And it wasn't like a show. It was like a battle of the band. So all people we know, it was the most embarrassing. I can't look at the, it's on video. I can't yeah. look at it. It's 20 years, 20, almost 25 years later. I still can't look at it. When somebody is not showing up at the office, you feel it. The mm -hmm. music is different. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a bigger piece orchestra now. Like when it was just three of us, it was very similar. Mm -hmm. um, everybody has to have a role. And then as crazy as it is, like we wouldn't know the Chili Peppers if it wasn't for Rick Rubin. Mm -hmm. And uh, fact check me on that because he might have, he, there might have been a producer before him, but Rick Rubin yeah, blew no, them up. I, yeah. Uh, I, I wouldn't be a, a business if it wasn't for my controller, mm -hmm. and be, if it wasn't for my receptionist who is important. 
and my assistant who makes sure that I'm going or my zoning guy who like, you know how you have like stage hands and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not the rock star it, because the portrayal of it is that's, that's the, but I'm not, I'm, I'm very much a small part mm -hmm. of the larger equation. And I think it's the same thing in bands when we, several of our clients are celebrities and I have actually gotten text messages from them while they're performing literally <laughs> in a state I could show it to you. I got to leave it because of NDAs and they're in between songs. Literally, I'm like, aren't you playing right now? And then he sends me a picture from like off the stage with the the crowd in the middle Th of the thinking set. about that shingle in the gutter. I detail. swear to God, I swear to God. Can you, I just spoke to my wife who's there backstage, and we think that we should take two feet out of the kitchen. It's bizarre. And when I tell you this person, it, there's you cannot. It's the get, most unrock and roll thing I can imagine, but I love it. It, you know, I was shocked. I was shocked. And just like us, that was Groundhog Day, mm -hmm. it's not for them. That stage, when they go from Yankee Stadium to Wrigley Field, somebody runs out there, takes that whole stage down, yep. and then transport. It's not multiple. And then transfer to, and that's what we have to do. We have to keep doing it and then give a unique experience and make a connection with people. It's so much, because it's art, mm -hmm. right? So at the core, I could be, I could be an architect that is like from the fountainhead and I won't, you want stone on your house? I'm not giving you stone on your house. I don't know who that serves. Mm -hmm. And I don't really know that many architects, to be honest. Like I think architects give other architects a bad gig or a, a bad reputation. But if you're that guy or that girl doing that type of art, you're not serving anybody mm -hmm. and it's service. This is a service business. When you're in a band, record sales are everything. And when you're in architecture, people paying you is everything. Yeah. You cannot support yourself otherwise. Yeah, love it. It's a perfect place to conclude the conversation there. Dan, absolutely amazing. This is awesome. Thank you so much for all your hospitality today and showing uh, me around. Uh, really, you know, very inspiring what you've done in, you. in a relatively sh short period of time. Um, and, you know, it's an extraordinary business and let's do this again in a short period of time. I would love to. Thank you so much for this. Awesome. Appreciate it. And that's a wrap. And one more thing, if you haven't already, please do head on over to iTunes or Spotify and leave us a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show and we'd love to get your feedback and we'd love to hear what it is that you'd like to see more of and what you love about the show already. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.